All right. Welcome, everybody, to this installment of Astronomy at Home. My name is Meredith, and I'm standing in for your usual host, Nicole. Astronomy at Home is brought to you by the Dirac Institute at the University of Washington Astronomy Department and also Astronomy on Tap Seattle in collaboration, and we're very glad that you're here tonight. So I may be a slightly familiar face. I uh, was the speaker a couple of weeks ago, as you may recall, telling you all about satellites and stuff, but this week I have the pleasure of being the host. So just to remind you how this will work, we are going to have a talk very soon from a special guest. And then uh, the whole time during the talk, if you are joining us on Zoom, you are welcome to write any questions that come up in the chat box. If you're joining us on YouTube, you are also welcome to write any questions that you may have in the uh, live chat there as well. And then after the speaker is done, we will go through and uh, do some Q&A with your questions. So the plan is to wrap this up. Um, around 8.45, so everyone can take a little break. And then if anybody is interested in joining an Instagram live interview after the official portion of the talk at nine o'clock, uh, AOT Seattle on Instagram will be hosting uh, that on, on Instagram. So you can join us there as well. So our speaker tonight is a professor in the University of Washington Astronomy Department who studies massive stars. And tonight she is going to tell us all about the adventures and the misadventures of observational astronomy and her brand new book that came out just two days ago. So please join me in welcoming Professor Emily Lebeck. Hi everybody, thanks so much for joining us here tonight. And I can't wait to share a little bit about some stories of life as a professional astronomer. So I'll get my slides up and running so that you all can see them. And I wanted to start out by talking a little bit about um, the book itself. So my book is titled The Last Stargazers. It's a popular science book for a general audience. And it's meant to give people a kind of behind the scenes view of what life is like for me and Meredith and the other folks that you've heard from during Astronomy on Tap as we kind of take a look at how our jobs go. This is actually my first popular science book. I, um, I've previously written textbooks, but this was my first foray into a book that kind of got sold widely. And it's been my first experience with publishing. So I came across a cute little like internet quiz the other day saying, what is the first line of the first chapter of your first book? And there's all these like wonderful respected authors giving like famous first lines, like, you know, call me Ishmael and all these like wonderful historic lines. And I took a look at mine and the very first line of the first chapter of my first book is, have you tried turning it off and on again? So this sounds like an opening to an IT crowd episode, but this is actually a quote from an observing run back in, I think it was about 2009, that I heard while I was sitting here. So this is the Subaru telescope at Mauna Kea Observatory in Hawaii. So Subaru is like a lot of major telescopes known mainly for the size of its primary mirror. The bigger a telescope's mirror is, the more light it can gather, the dimmer an object we can observe, and it sort of turns the, the reach of the telescope into something even more powerful because we can see very distant objects in the universe. The Subaru telescope had a mirror that was more than 27 feet across. So for context, this is me standing underneath another very similar mirror. This is a almost 27 foot mirror on the Gemini telescope atop Cerro Pachon in Chile. I'm about five foot three, which isn't that tall, but it's still giving you some scale for just how enormous a mirror like that is. So I was sitting in a control room about one story under this enormous mirror. And when I was observing, the te telescope was pointed something like this. So this is a nice example of how a telescope is structured. You would see the telescope's mirror near the bottom of the screen and high above it is a secondary mirror. So light will come pouring into the dome through the open slit of the dome, bounce off the primary and then bounce back up to a secondary and then get directed into a camera or another mirror or wherever we might want to send the light. I was talking to somebody because this telescope had emitted a very unpleasant noise earlier in the night. And 
the operator who was running the telescope had frozen next to me. I was the astronomer deciding what the telescope would point at, but the operator was the one in charge of keeping the telescope safe. I turned to her and said, you know, why did the telescope make that noise? That didn't sound great. And she paused for a minute and then said, no, it's fine. I think the mirror's still on the telescope. And I think I looked at her and said, you think? <laughs> That's, that is not a reassuring idea. So the alarm had come about because the supports holding that secondary mirror in place had apparently failed. That secondary mirror weighed more than 400 pounds. It's more than four feet across. It's not nearly as big as that giant primary, but it's still pretty good sized. And apparently this alarm meant that we were at risk of tipping the telescope the wrong way and dumping that 400 pound piece of glass onto the floor. So, I called the observatory support staff and asked them what to do. Is there a way to confirm that those are working? And they way too calmly said, no, it's probably fine. It's probably not a problem. It's probably just a false alarm. Try turning it off and on again. And I was a graduate student at the time. I was 24. I was doing research for my PhD thesis that I desperately needed. And I knew that if the telescope malfunctioned and I had to leave that night, that was it. I just lost that night of time. Somebody else would come the next night with a new program. I would have to wait maybe an entire year before I could do my research, finish my thesis, graduate, move, try to wind up on the same continent as my boyfriend at the time. So I really wanted to make sure that I could observe, but I was also terrified of something going wrong. I'd heard horror stories from other astronomers about telescopes that had had some undefined thing go wrong and winding up in this disastrous heap. And I didn't want to be the grad student that had killed the Subaru telescope or whatever happened to this telescope, which is a story about the Green Bank radio telescope that is told in the book. So in the end, I sort of gritted my teeth and looked at Subaru, which I was in charge of and all of my, you know, 24 year old, they don't even let me rent a car without paying for extra insurance glory looked at my observing program, looked at the operator. She looked back at me. I turned the telescope off and I turned it on again. So this was just one of many unusual or bizarre or surprising nights at a telescope that went a bit differently than I might've expected when I was first imagining what an astronomer's job would be like. This imagination of what we do in our jobs is what drove me to write the last stargazers. Because when I tell people that I'm an astronomer, everybody has a question about space. Everybody loves space. You do not have to sell somebody on the fact that these kinds of pictures are awesome, that stars are cool, that black holes are just the weirdest thing ever. People love hearing about the space itself. But whenever I tell somebody on an airplane that I'm an astronomer, the immediate next question after, oh, can you explain black holes or time or aliens is, what do you actually do all day? Or, you know, how are you awake right now? I thought astronomers would just work nights. Um, people have asked me if I go to the Hubble Space Telescope, which I would love to do, but it's a little inaccessible. And I found that when people imagine what an astronomer does, these are kind of the mental images they have in mind. They tend to picture a guy standing at a telescope that he's going to look through. He's inexplicably wearing a lab coat and occasionally safety goggles. And there's this sort of very awkward image that comes to mind when people try to illustrate an astronomer or put an astronomer in a stock photo or imagine what an astronomer does. And I thought that our jobs are were pretty unusual and unique and tend to surprise people. There are no lab coats. We don't look through the telescopes with our eyes anymore, but the research that we do can be surprisingly adventurous and exciting. So that was where the idea for The Last Stargazers came from. I was writing it, I have to admit, thinking about sort of my own introduction and my own entry into astronomy. So this is me in 1990. Um, I'm six and psyched that Hubble has launched and you can see me proudly wearing my new Hubble t-shirt. I knew by then that I loved space and that I wanted to do something with science and something with astronomy, but I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't know any scientists growing up. Nobody in my family was a scientist. Nobody in the town where I grew up was a scientist. And everything I knew about astronomy or science, I had learned from movies. 
uh, these jobs looked hair raising and exciting. Um, there seemed to be a lot of adventure and a lot of danger, but I also really wasn't sure what my day-to-day -day life would be like. I figured you didn't run from dinosaurs or tornadoes or talk to aliens every day. So I was unclear on exactly what my job would be like. And I didn't really get a good idea until I headed to Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona for my very first observing run. I was in college. I was working with Philip Massey, who is an astronomer at Lowell Observatory. And we drove to Kitt Peak, showed up that first night for what would be one of five nights on one of the telescopes on the mountain. And we went to dinner with all of the other astronomers. Phil very kindly introduced me and said, this is Emily, she's brand new, this is her first observing run. And all of the other astronomers immediately said hi and got really excited and immediately started telling me stories. They were so eager to share what their job was like, what their nights were like, and some of the ridiculous things that had happened to people. So one person would look across the table and say, oh, I you know, remember this one story about a guy who was in the middle of observing and locked himself in the bathroom and the telescope was just spinning away above him and he lost like two hours of time in the story. In reality, the story is true. You can see it described in someone's research paper. They only lost about 15 minutes. And then someone else said, well, you know, that's a good story. But I remember hearing about some time when lightning struck one of the domes right here on Kitt Peak. And somebody said it was the loudest sound they'd ever heard in their life. Lightning actually strikes the domes on Kitt Peak pretty regularly. It occasionally causes a little bit of problems, but I've talked to a number of astronomers, including some folks who I know are on this call, who have been sitting in a dome during a lightning strike and heard the unbelievable crash of what that sounds like, because these are big, tall metal things that we put on tops of mountains. And then someone else turns and says, yeah, yeah, those are good stories, but did you hear the one about the telescope that got shot? That is a true story. There is a telescope in Texas that has been shot. You can see in that picture on the lower right, the little black dots of six bullet holes that landed in the mirror and then later got dug out. And if you want that full story, you should most definitely check it out in the book. I was fascinated to hear these both because I knew that they were sort of a way of folks welcoming me into the observing astronomer crowd. And also because in between all the wackiness, I was also learning just a little bit about what our jobs were like, what it meant to sit in a dome all night, why exactly it was so bad if you lost 15 minutes because you were stuck in a bathroom. And it gave me my first window into what our work was actually going to involve. So that then led to The Last Stargazers. So this book is available now. You can get it wherever books are sold. Um, you can get it at the website on the upper left. And I think we're putting a link to one of our local bookstores here in Seattle in the chat. And it gives people a behind the scenes look at what life is like as a professional astronomer. It goes through the stories and sometimes really surprising adventures involved in how we study the universe. And it looks at the science and the excitement of the scientists that kind of underlies the great discoveries that we've seen happening in recent years in astronomy. So to start understanding that, I start the book by exploring how we used to observe. Because a big theme throughout the book is how observing is changing and how the way we do astronomy is changing. About half a century ago, the most common tool for using, maybe a little longer, um, the most common tool for capturing images in astronomy was something like this. So this is a glass photographic plate. These were plates um, that could be sold by the crate load by Kodak that were treated with a special chemical on one side that would darken when you exposed it to light. So you could, in theory, just buy one of these plates, stick it in a telescope, expose it to a star or galaxy or whatever you wanted to study, and wait for the plate to darken in those places where the starlight or galaxy light hit it, giving you this nice little color negative image of what you are observing. What I just described is wildly easier than how this work was actually done. These plates would get shipped to you and then astronomers would use all sorts of tricks to make them as sensitive to light as possible. They would bake the plates or freeze them. They would treat them with distilled water or ammonia. Um, one person swore by treating plates with lemon juice so that they would respond to light as quickly as possible. The plates also had to be sliced down to the exact size that would let them fit into a telescope's camera. You can see the perfect rectangular plate being held up in the picture here. It didn't come from Kodak like that. It had to be hand designed. And that all had to be done in the dark because if you expose the plate to light, the plate was finished. 
the plate then had to get loaded into a camera facing the right way with that chemical treatment pointed toward the light that would be coming from the sky. If you put it in backwards, it wouldn't work. So people started to get into the habit of licking plates or tapping plates to their lips so they could find the sticky bit where the chemi chemical was before they loaded it into the camera. Once all of that work was done, you couldn't just walk away and run the telescope necessarily. You had to stay next to the plate all night in the camera. And these cameras would sometimes be mounted high above a telescope's primary mirror, right where that secondary mirror was that I almost dropped in Subaru. So this is a picture of an astronomer sitting at a, what we called a prime focus camera high above a telescope's primary mirror that astronomer is actually Edwin Hubble. You would climb into a telescope and sit there loading and unloading plates and exposing and exposing plates all night in the freezing cold for hours and hours. Getting down was not an easy prospect if you had any maybe natural reason to get down. So these were long, arduous nights. It kind of sounds like a goofy way to do science. And you would look at that and think, well, how could we ever learn anything about the universe from just, you know, dunking plates and lemon juice, licking them, and then kind of shivering next to them while we wait for, you know, the universe to tell us what's going on. We actually did astonishing science using glass plates. There was an astronomer in 1912 named Henrietta Swan Levitt that used plate observations from a telescope in Peru to discover what we call Cepheid variables. So these are variable stars that will vary based on how bright they are. The brighter and more luminous Cepheids will get brighter and dimmer as a function of time. And you can tie the speed of their variation to how bright the stars are and use that as a way of telling how far away the star is. In short, if you know how bright it should be, and you know how bright it appears, you know how much space must, between, must be between you and that Cepheid. It made them really amazing tools for measuring really large distances in the universe. Edwin Hubble then used Henrietta Swan Levitt's discovery a little over a decade later in this plate. So this is a glass plate that Hubble, the person, took of what we called at the time the Andromeda Nebula. So this is this very pretty spiral nebula that people knew in the sky. And Hubble got these observations and marked with a red pencil this VAR that you see in the upper left there. He had discovered a Cepheid variable in the Andromeda Nebula, which meant he could measure the distance to the Andromeda Nebula. And when he did, the result was stunning. This wasn't the Andromeda Nebula, this was the Andromeda Galaxy. He had discovered evidence that this was an entire new galaxy beyond our own Milky Way. This totally changed how we understood the size and scope of the universe. It meant there were other galaxies beyond our own. It completely rattled the way that we imagined our cosmos. And it happened using glass plates. So they might seem like simple tools, but the science we were able to do with them was completely incredible. This is what a Hubble observation might look like today. We've gone from Andromeda with Hubble the person to Andromeda with Hubble the telescope. This is now one of our modern digital images that we have of the Andromeda galaxy, courtesy of Julianne Dalcanton, our astronomy department chair here at the University of Washington. So now we have digital gorgeous data and we can do a lot more work with it, but this doesn't mean that astronomy is entirely free of stories. So one of my favorite stories and my absolute favorite one to tell here in Washington happened at Manastash Ridge Observatory, which is a small telescope here in Washington state and one that the University of Washington uses frequently for research and for teaching purposes. Back in 1980, a University of Washington graduate student named Doug Geisler was using this telescope to actually get the first night of data for his thesis observations. By the time I finish this, it's going to sound like PhD thesis observations are cursed. They might be a little bit. So he got one beautiful night of data at Manastash Ridge Observatory. And like any good observer at the time, he took a very careful log entry describing his night. Now you can see in the log entry, you give the year, the month, and the day, and Washingtonians might already recognize where this story is going when they see the date of May 18th, 1980. He had on this particular night, a beautiful clear night, clouds cleared off, great seeing, which means that the atmosphere was nice and clear and he could get very good data filled out the night log, went to bed, and at some point in the middle of that night, he remembered waking up and hearing a loud boom. 
while he was sleeping. He didn't really register what that boom was until he woke up around noon and tried to get dressed and head outside and get started on preparing for a night of observations. And you can see what he wrote in his log entry. Yikes, there is no day. It's completely black, think inky black. He opened the door and thought the world had ended. He couldn't see more than 10 feet in front of him, even with a flashlight. He could smell sort of the sour brimstone smell in the air and he was just shocked at what he was seeing. Now today we would just check our smartphone to find out what the heck had happened. At the time he didn't have this option so he had to run to a radio, but he did eventually find out what he was standing in the middle of. That morning, Mount St. Helens had erupted. And the Mount St. Helens eruption effectively blew off a side of the mountain. And it sent this plume of ash and volcanic detritus kind of flying out over Washington state, right over Manastash Ridge Observatory and right over Doug. So he was sitting smack in the path of the result of this eruption and waking up to that on an observing night when you would be on the mountain alone, kind of hoping for night two of your thesis research was just a shock. But Doug was a good scientist and a good astronomer, and he carefully wrote out a log entry for what happened to his second night. He lost six hours that night. The reason that he gave was volcano, and he described in detail what it was like to actually be on the mountain when this happened, how he eventually got word from the radio. You'll notice at the bottom of the log entry that he notes that he covered the telescopes and instruments being very careful that that corrosive ash from the volcano wouldn't damage the precious telescope mirror. But this has now just gone down in observatory lore, especially here in Washington, as one of the more incredible things that can happen to someone while they're at a telescope. Doug actually wound up giving me the chapter title for the fourth chapter of my book, where I look at some of the other natural quirks that can happen to us at observatories. So hours lost, six reason volcano. I talk about natural quirks at observatories and there are a few other sort of citizens of earth that we share our telescopes with. Um, we are on mountains in the middle of nowhere. We're in fairly undeveloped areas and you'll occasionally run into wildlife that you might not really see in your day-to-day -day life. I think maybe the most famous creatures that we see in Chile are these guys. So these are Chilean tarantulas. They are about this big, if you can see my hands, and I swear they don't grow every time I tell it. They're pretty sizable animals. They're also extraordinarily sweet natured and shy and very nervous around people and tend to prefer to hide in their corners, but they get greeted with a little bit of a shriek whenever someone sees one for the first time because they are alarming and big. You'd think that tarantulas would be everybody's sort of most annoying bug or most annoying many-legged creature at an observatory. They are not. If you ask a lot of astronomers, particularly in the American Southwest, they will all start complaining about these. So it might not be easy to tell what these are. This is a photograph taken at Kitt Peak Observatory, the same observatory where I had my first observing run. And every single one of those little red dots is a ladybug. Ladybug swarms will hit observatories in the American Southwest and just get on everything. I think people will sometimes say, oh, you know, ladybugs are cute and they're lucky and they are less cute when there are a gabillion of them. <laughs> they get into everything. They can climb into domes. They'll climb into equipment. They'll climb into the tracks that you turn a dome on and clog it up. They'll get into um, instruments, electronics, just everywhere. Um, another similar issue are Miller moths, which will also show up in mega swarms at observatories. So kind of battling back the bugs and battling back the nature is a constant annoyance of astronomers at telescopes everywhere. There are some cuter animals that we'll run into. Um, this is a photo taken from something called an all-sky camera at Las Campanas Observatory, again in Chile. So an all-sky camera is this little panoramic camera that stands on a tall stand and will basically point up at the night sky during an observation so that you can glance at it and say, oh, there's some clouds to the east. It's kind of clear to the west. We might want to, you know, point the telescope here or there. It basically helps you get your bearings in the sky. These all sky camera towers are a bit tall and owls have now figured out that they can perch on the camera as a really great sort of hunting spot. So people will be observing peer over in the middle of the night and they'll suddenly see this guy staring back at them or you'll get like fluffy owl butt standing right in the middle of the camera in the middle of an observation. But 
I always kind of like these reminders as we're observing and as our minds are, you know, millions of miles away on other planets, seeing sort of this little bits of evidence that we aren't the only, you know, Earth citizens that might need to find our way in the universe and that some of these other little guys are hanging out nearby. So another thing that we'll sometimes run into at observatories is less interference from humans and or less interference from animals and more interference from humans. We are very good at occasionally tricking ourselves with signals that we find in the night sky. And one of my favorite examples of this happened at Parks Observatory, which is a radio telescope in Australia. So just to give people a brief reminder, radio telescopes operate very similarly in physics to optical telescopes, but they just study a very different type of light. When we think about the electromagnetic spectrum, we tend to think about just visible light, which I've highlighted in yellow. So the light that we can see with our own eyes, but light actually comes at much shorter wavelengths to the left. So things like ultraviolet light or x-rays or gamma rays and light comes at much longer wavelengths that you can see to the right. So infrared light or radio light. And as we go to longer wavelengths, the designs of our telescopes can sometimes change a little bit. So the telescope here is a radio telescope. We've still got that big curved primary reflecting surface, and we've still got something that that surface is going to bounce light up to to be collected and studied. It just now looks a lot different than an optical telescope because the light it's reflecting are big long radio waves instead of very short visible light waves. So this telescope was working away in Australia and a young scientist named Emily Petroff showed up there interested in studying something called a fast radio burst. So Parks had recently discovered this short blast of radio waves and people had been a bit stymied as to what it might be. They were saying, you know, we don't know of any natural phenomenon that could create a burst of radio light. We need to maybe figure out what this is. And then employees at Parks Observatory kind of started shaking their heads and going, no, 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 we know what these are. We detect these all the time. There are these weird little bursts of radio light, but they must be coming from something on the ground. We have no idea what they are, but clearly radio bursts from space aren't real. So Emily Petroff decided that she wanted to get to the bottom of this because if radio bursts from space were real, we had to be able to distinguish whatever we were doing on the ground from whatever we were getting from space. And she and the staff of Parks Observatory sort of set out on this mission to explain what they were seeing. And their first clue came when they noticed that these weird events, which got nicknamed peritons, it's a mythical creature that looks like one thing, but is something else. They realized that these peritons were clustering during the lunchtime hour. So that was the first sign that this probably wasn't coming from space and that it had to be coming from something here on earth. There were several support buildings in the observatory complex around the radio telescope. And they'd started to notice that you would get a lot of peritons at lunch when people would be doing something like microwaving a meal. They tried running the microwaves and watching the telescope and they got nothing. They were very careful and very scientific. And they said, you know, we took microwaves and we microwaved a meal or we microwaved a ceramic mug full of water. They were very careful about this. And the scientific paper that they wrote up about microwaving things at telescopes, you can see the exact breakdown of what they did. And they couldn't produce a blast of radio light. Somebody finally realized that they were being way too scientific about this. They were acting like careful experimental scientists and sticking a mug of water in the microwave and hitting the time and patiently waiting until it was done. So think about when you microwave a meal or when you microwave popcorn and you're hungry and you're watching it counting down, you're going five seconds, four set fine. And you open the microwave door to stop the microwave. When they did that, they realized that the microwave released a blast of radio light that got detected as a periton. They finally explained where this weird signal was coming from. And then they went back to their data figuring, okay, we've explained what bursts of radio waves come from, we're done. And they explained almost all of them. Parks had actually found a real fast radio burst that had previously been lost in the chaos of these peritons. So by uncovering 
these microwaves that they were detecting, they also wound up uncovering this really wonderful new mystery in astronomy. We still don't know what peritons are. We still don't know exactly how to explain these, but we now know that they're not microwaves and we know how we can start to search for more and how we can start to explore where they come from. So just to wrap up, I wanted to look at a couple of the other great extremes that we go to in astronomy. And these are all stories told in detail in the book. People are really amazed at some of the exploration that we get to do in the name of astronomy on our own planet. We get to travel to places like Svalbard, Norway, which is in the upper right photo, to get ourselves into the paths of total solar eclipses, bringing professional telescopes with us to study those eclipses. We'll do things like put telescopes on balloons or put telescopes at the South Pole. The scientist on the lower right there is George Carruthers, who designed an ultraviolet telescope that eventually got placed on the surface of the moon. So we will go absolutely all over the planet to try and gather the light that we use to study the universe. We will even put telescopes in the back of planes. So this is the stratospheric observatory for infrared astronomy that was pictured on the upper left. It has a telescope operating out the open back door of a specially modified 747 that will fly into the stratosphere and open that door. In the stratosphere, we're above almost all of the water vapor in Earth's atmosphere. So we can get really incredible observations that wouldn't be possible from the ground. I actually got the chance to fly aboard Sophia last year for some of my research on how stars die and how stars end their lives as supernovae. We flew out of New Zealand. We flew over the Antarctic coast. I was actually able to see the Southern lights from inside the plane. It was the first time I'd ever seen the Aurora. And I think that if you had grabbed a little six-year-old me and described what work as an astronomer would be like and said, you know, one day, you are going to be sitting in a telescope plane, staring at these southern lights while a telescope in the back takes your data. I absolutely never would have believed it. It's a story I would have desperately wanted to hear. So on that note, I wanna wrap up so that we have time for some discussion and questions. I will leave the book information up here one more time and I'm happy to answer any Q&A. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Emily. Let's everybody give a nice virtual round of applause to Emily. If you're on Zoom, you can uh, use a little emoji react button if, you, uh, if you'd like. <laughs> that was excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, before we get to questions, I just want to make sure that everybody saw in the, if you're on Zoom, I put a link to uh, one place where you can buy Emily's book. Uh, you can pretty much get it anywhere. And uh, I trust that Jim probably put a similar link over for the YouTube folks, which is great. Um, so definitely check that out if you want to hear the full story. Um, but we do have some time for questions. Uh, so I don't believe we have any questions right now in the Zoom. Uh, have folks uh, put any questions over at YouTube, Jim? No, we're the stream there is a couple seconds behind. So I will let you know as soon as we have them there. No worries. But there's a lot of uh, clapping emojis and a lot of thanks. People, <laughs> people really dug this. This was amazing, Emily. Oh, great. Well, and the problem is I could have probably talked for about another hour. Um, I've got, I, you never do one of these without a copy of your book right here. This is not a thin book and you wouldn't believe the tomes of stories I have from my interviews with people that didn't make the cut. I interviewed over a hundred people for this book and I absolutely could have made the book three times as long, possibly just with ladybug stories, but certainly once we went <laughs> through, you know, the full realm of everything that people had ever had happened to them at telescopes. So it's a, it's a rich area. Well, could you share with us one of your favorite stories that you weren't able to fit in the book? Oh, favorite story that didn't make the cut. Um, I actually, it did crack me up that I had to trim down the um, creatures on the mountain stories as much as I did. And my editors came back to me saying, you know, you really go through a lot of this. Um, are, are the moths really that bad? I'm going, yes. Um, but I had a lot of people tell me stories about these great little animals called um, viscachas. Um, so there, I do mention the sketches in the book, but just briefly, but there are these little critters in Chile that sort of look like wise bunny grandfathers. They have these little rabbit ears and long whiskers and little curved tails. They're actually relatives of chinchillas. And astronomers know them because they love watching sunsets, randomly enough. We'll all be out watching the sun go down next to a telescope and we'll see the sketches kind of next to us dotting the hillside for some reason, staring at the sun along with us. 
Um, something I didn't learn until I was interviewing people is that the Viscachas have occasionally wandered into telescope domes. They'll get a little bold in the middle of the night and kind of wiggle their way through the door. Um, I think somebody came across one um, hanging out in one of the restrooms trying to like get a, get a drink out of the sink or something like that or would scare one and it would go running off into the night. Um, but it's amazing how bold these animals will be in areas where they haven't learned to be afraid of people yet. So you really do get to see some surprising things. That's wild. <laughs> <laughs> so we did, have, we did have one question come in over here. Uh, this is from Matthew. He says, I've never been an astronomer type. I'm a bioscientist, but wondering what is the most primitive tech still in use today to observe the universe? Oh, that's a good question. I... I actually tried to find a place that still had any kind of plate capability. Um, I wanted to ride where I showed that picture of Edwin Hubble. I wanted to see what it was like to be in a prime focus cage and nobody would do it. Um, this, is a, this isn't the most like story friendly answer. Some of our most primitive tech for sure is some of our scientific code. Um, I absolutely, all the astronomers are laughing. I absolutely have Fortran code on my computer that runs that actually works. And any computer scientist is just appalled when they see this, but at the same time, we're kind of like, you know, it works and it's been working for a while. So we're gonna keep using it. And there's this kind of funny out of step dance that everybody in astronomy is doing, trying to improve our code. But so much of our science is code based because our only data points are light a lot of the times. I've sometimes read field work stories from bio or other fields like that with envy because you'll hear about field biologists going out into the field and collecting samples. And they have some of their own hilarious stories of, you know, how do you write it down when you were trying to collect a sample and one of them bit you and you threw it reflexively before you got to add it to your, <laughs> like, we don't necessarily get these, but our data is so digital now that a lot of our tech surrounds how to gather the data, how to analyze the data, and how to study it. Um, so yeah, our, our most primitive stuff is probably on the computational side, and our most advanced stuff is probably on the computational side. It runs a pretty broad gamut. There's a good question here on the YouTube side. Uh, somebody, uh, Brandon asking, uh, is there a pattern to the locations of the observatories around the world? Yes, that's a wonderful question. Um, I'll sometimes give longer versions of talks like this to astronomy clubs or um, even to kids, and I'll try to get them to guess what our patterns are. So we like to put observatories in very high, dry places. Um, and people have asked, you know, does putting an observatory high on a mountain help because you're closer to the stars? And we are technically closer to the stars, but what really matters is that we're above a lot of the atmosphere. The distance from us to a star is so huge that the tiny difference of a mountain won't matter. But our atmosphere changes a great deal once we get to the top of a mountain. So it makes the weather better. It makes the view that we get clear. Um, dry also tends to mean that we're dealing with less water vapor and we might be dealing with better weather. You'll also notice that a lot of observatories are kind of clustered near Earth's equator because the closer we get to the equator, the more we can get a simultaneous view of the northern and the southern skies. If we were to put a telescope right at the South Pole, which we have, we get a wonderful view of the southern sky, but we can't see any northern objects. So if you put a telescope in Hawaii or Arizona or northern Chile, you're getting close to the equator and you're kind of opening up the amount of sky that you're able to see over the course of the year. And then finally, we want them to be very remote and very dark. Yeah, those are those are all important things. Yes, <laughs> I've got I've got another one over here. Uh, well, for what it was partially a comment uh, from Richard saying that he both writes and loves Fortran. So you have some Fortran fan members in our audience this evening. <laughs> um, he also asks, can you talk about the next generation of sensors that you're expecting to see? What possibilities will that open up for astronomy? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, the next generation of sensors. Um, I, I would love to ask an instrumentation specialist about what we think might supersede a CCD, because this is an entire amazing field in astronomy. It's the people who design and build the instruments that we actually 
fashion. I tend to use them as amazing tools, but I could not open one up and fix it. And we have colleagues who are brilliant at that. Um, I do think that when you just talk about the next really powerful CCDs that we have coming, um, the Vera C. Rubin Observatory, which is the enormous survey telescope that UW is a founding partner of, it's currently under construction in Chile, that is going to have a, is it a 3.2 gigapixel camera? Am I getting, so, okay, good, nodding. Um, this is just an indescribably huge um, camera that we're using to photograph the night sky over and over. For a decade, we're going to be making a 10 year long movie of a huge swath of the Southern sky. And to put 3.2 gigapixels into context, you could take one picture from the Vera C. Rubin Observatory and you would need 1500 high definition televisions to display it. So that is the level of detail and the level of you know pixel fidelity that we're getting with an instrument like that. So that's an extraordinary application of today's technology in terms of tomorrow's technology. I kind of can't wait to see what we come up with. There's a the question on the YouTube side uh, from uh, Kamen, wondering if you'd say a little bit more about your work, maybe how it fits into this whole story. You talked a little bit yeah. about your observing experience. Yeah, so I study very massive stars and how they die. Um, so these are stars that are at least eight times as massive as our sun. And that makes them massive enough that when they die, their cores actually collapse into neutron stars or black holes. And they produce these massive fireworks shows that we see as supernovae. So I'm really interested in the physics that governs the kind of late stages of those stars before they become a supernova. So I'm really curious about how things like how fast the star spins or whether the star is interacting with a binary companion or whether the star has a strong magnetic field, what, what all of that winds up doing to the way the star works. I got into this during that very first observing trip to Kitt Peak that I talked about in the presentation because my advisor had said, you know, you can work on blue massive stars, you can work on red massive stars. I was literally given a like pick the red team or the blue team um, or like cut type analogy. And I went with the red stars because I knew that they were closer to black holes. And I really wanted to study black holes. I figured stars were kind of boring and stars were kind of simple and they were really just balls of gas. How complicated could they be? And that summer just blew my mind learning how complicated stars could be and how much we didn't know about them and how much we could learn about them as we sort of used the telescopes that we have to get really amazing new data on them. So they are now my life's work is trying to understand how these stars are put together and the physics that governs how they evolve and then die. Does that mean you don't study blue stars at all? I occasionally study blue stars. Um, I tend to study stars that are cooling off because they're getting ready to die, but I do sometimes wind up with very bright blue stars. Um, usually they're behaving in some very strange and unusual way, but I actually really love the weird, unusual, bizarre stars. So those are the ones that I'll prefer to spend my time studying. Fair enough. Uh, we have a couple more here. Um, Jackson asks, are there any interesting options for citizen science work in astronomy these days? Definitely. Um, I think the first place I would say to check out is um, the American Association of Variable Star Observers. So this is a group of amateur astronomers that are taking all of these amazing observations of stars and studying how those stars change as a function of time. Uh, we're really used to kind of thinking of the sky as static and unchanging and saying, oh, well, the same stars are up there tonight and they'll be up there again tomorrow night. And there's not really that much that's different. And in fact, lots of stars are variable and we watch their brightness change with time. And the sort of mass of amateur astronomers that can help us monitor their brightness is really spectacular. There's also a great website called Zooniverse that does citizen science um, programs in and beyond astronomy. It got started as an astronomy project because they had huge heaps of images of galaxies and they figured one great way to try and classify a galaxy to tell whether it was spiral shaped or blob shaped or ellipse shaped or eh, we don't know was to get a bunch of citizen scientists in on the deal so they had a little training program that taught people how to classify galaxies and it quickly took on a life of its own um, the citizen scientists discovered a new type of galaxy out of that project um, 
And that then spawned Zooniverse. So there's citizen science projects in a bunch of different disciplines, but astronomy is still very well represented on the website. So I'd check out Zooniverse. We've got questions both on the Zoom and on the YouTube asking about Beetlejuice. So, I mean, I'll summarize them as what's up with Beetlejuice? <laughs> that is an excellent, you didn't plant these questions, did you? No, I swear I didn't. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this is a great question that multiple people talking on this video right now are interested in. Um, so Betelgeuse is the red supergiant in the constellation Orion's shoulder. Um, so anybody who's wondering what exactly we're talking about has almost certainly noticed Betelgeuse if you've ever checked out the constellation Orion and seen the very bright red star in it. Last winter, Betelgeuse started doing something really strange. It got shockingly dim and it got dim very fast. Um, we didn't expect either of these things to happen. We knew that Betelgeuse's brightness would vary, but it varying on that time scale and to that degree was really surprising to us. Um, some astronomers had been monitoring it for a while and they put out a sort of brief note for other astronomers saying, hey, Betelgeuse is getting really dim. We should keep an eye on it. This is really far past anything else it's done. And then the news got a hold of what they'd found and this immediately turned into a headline of Betelgeuse surely about to explode any second now, which was not true, but it garnered a lot of attention for Betelgeuse. And a lot of the rest of us got curious of trying to explain, you know, why it was behaving the way it did. What we think now Betelgeuse was up to is we think that the star shed some mass from its outer layers. We know that red supergiants like Betelgeuse will do this periodically. They'll kind of puff off mass that cools off and condenses into dust. And when I say dust, it's not that different from what we all picture when we hear dust. It would block light and make Betelgeuse look dimmer than it was by kind of being between us and it. We think that that is the best explanation for why Betelgeuse suddenly got dim. We think it puffed up some dust and the dust blocked our view and then dissipated and Betelgeuse brightened again. We actually got some observations, um, my colleagues and I got observations measuring Betelgeuse's temperature and realized its temperature had stayed about the same during all of this. So the temperature probably wasn't a culprit for why it dimmed, that dust production seemed to be the trick and we were really happy with our answer. It still seems like the best explanation. But was it two weeks ago? Um, two weeks ago, a Betelgeuse right now is hard for us to study at night because it would be up during the day. And some observations from space showed us that Betelgeuse is actually starting to get dim again. So maybe it puffed off some more mass. We don't know. Maybe it's doing something else bizarre that didn't occur to us. We still don't think that its temperature is much of a culprit, but I can't wait until we can start observing it again with really good telescopes because it's clearly doing something really cool. I'm really glad that that question got asked. So yes. thank you, everybody. He was like, Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse. <laughs> Say it um, three times. Yeah, only twice. And We're good. Astronomers will get very excited about using telescopes to study it. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we are right about at time. So I want to invite everybody to join us on Instagram in about 10, 15 minutes. Um, Jim, the co-host, and Emily will be uh, having a little casual interview chat. And you're welcome to ask some more questions over there if we didn't get to your question. Uh, to take a, take a moment to thank Emily again so much for joining us this evening. I hope you all go buy her book. Um, this has been really wonderful to, to see you all and to get to hear your stories. So thank you, Emily. Thank you all.